I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. I know that it's a busy time of year, um, but your presence means so much. And I know it's been such a great semester. If you're involved in a thread group, I have loved hearing stories come out of thread groups. As we have journeyed through this semester, you might remember in September, we kicked off in Exodus chapter 1 with Shifra and Pua, the Hebrew midwives. Then we moved on to Hannah's story in 1 Samuel 1 and 2. And last month, we were in Princess Tamar's story in 2 Samuel 13. So you may be wondering, who is our woven woman of the Bible for December? Who is our last woven woman of the year? Well, I got to tell you, when we kicked off the semester with Shifra and Pua, which were a couple of women I just couldn't wait to share their story with you, you might understand why now that you've heard it. I have been looking forward to the time that we could move on to Exodus chapter 2, because what's fascinating is before we get to Moses doing the things that God has called Moses to do, there are five women in the book of Exodus who precede him in acts of faith and of courage, and they help make a way for him to do what God has called him to do, to set the people of God free. So Shifra and Pua are two Hebrew midwives in the chapter one, but chapter two, we meet three unnamed Women. Now, we have talked about in Woven before that when women are not assigned names in the scripture, they are named and known before God, called and created according to his purposes with tremendous value. And so some of these women, we find their names out later. One of the women is the Pharaoh's daughter, um, often called the princess in this chapter too. One of the women is Moses' sister. We later find out her name is Miriam. And uh, the last woman is Moses' mom, his birth mom, and uh, she's not assigned a name in this chapter, but her name is Yokebed, and so Yokebed is actually our woven woman of the month for December, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with that name. I've not met a Yokebed in this day and age, much like Shifra and Pua. These are not popular names, but man, there are stories to learn from, stories that are tremendously encouraging to me. And so we're going to jump in just as a refresher for you to know where we've been in Exodus chapter 1, where we were in September, and what sets the stage for where we're going to jump in in chapter 2 today. You would know that there is a new king who comes to power in Egypt, and he no longer knew Joseph, and he also did not know the God of Joseph. And so as the Israelites were living as foreigners in Egypt... This king feared that which he didn't know, and that fear caused him to hate. And so you may recall that he forced the Israelites to become slaves under his leadership. And the more the people of God were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, as the people of God have done and still do throughout time. And so when that didn't work, he um, required these Hebrew midwives that every time Hebrew women were giving birth, if it's a boy, you need to kill him. And if it's a girl, you can let her live. Well, these Hebrew midwives stood up against the Pharaoh's evil decree, don't you remember? Praise God. And so they helped make a way for Moses to live. So when that didn't work, then the king took it a little further. The Pharaoh decreed that all the Egyptians would throw every newborn Hebrew baby boy into the Nile River. And that's where Exodus chapter 1 ends, is with that horrific decree. And so we're going to jump in in Exodus chapter 2. And we're only going to be in 10 verses tonight. As we look at the story of Yochebed, woven into this larger story of God. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, Exodus chapter 2, verse 1, says, About this time, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. The baby's sister then stood at a distance, watching to see what would happen to him. Soon, Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river, and her attendants walked along the riverbank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying. And she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. 
Then the baby's sister approached the princess. Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you, she asked. Yes, do, the princess replied. So the girl went and called the baby's mother. Take this baby and nurse him for me, the princess told the baby's mother. I will pay for your help. So the woman took her baby home and nursed him. Later, when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses, for she explained, I lifted him out of the water. Okay, so let's jump in. It's verse 1 says, about this time, a man, that man is Amram, and woman, that's Yochebed, from the tribe of Levi, got married. Now, when it says they're from the tribe of Levi, you may know that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons, which are the 12 tribes of Israel. And one of those sons was Levi. And it's from Levi's lineage that we are, get to know the priestly order of the people of God. See, this is very important, that both Moses' parents, both Amram and Yochebed, were in the priestly lineage of God's people, meaning they had a foundation, a firm foundation of belief in God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's important to note as we keep going, the woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. That's Moses. But we don't know what Yochebed named him. We don't know what she called him. We only know the name that was assigned to him by the Pharaoh's daughter, which is interesting. I wonder what she called him. She saw that he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. So even at birth, she could see that there was something special about him. I find this interesting in this month because if you were here last December, we, I wasn't. I was super sick with COVID, but Bryn Thompson led in my place as we dug into the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And now here again at Christmas time, we are familiar with her story once more. Mary could see that there's something really special about Jesus from birth. You know, Jesus is referred to in Matthew's gospel as the new Moses, so we are long before the coming of Jesus. But we've got Yochebed here, who I think has a lot in common with Mary. And she sees there's something special about her baby boy. The word that's used there um, in Hebrew is tov, which means good. It's actually what God says about his creation when he created us and he saw that it was good. She says the same thing. And you know, I find that fascinating because she knew about the decree. We've got to know that Amram and Yochebed were slaves. They were living as slaves in Egypt right now. And so not only was the future of her son one of slavery, before that he wouldn't even get to it. The future of her son was to be murdered, to be drowned in the Nile River. It's not like they had gender reveal parties back then and ultrasounds and sonograms. No, no. At the time of his birth, she found out his gender, and she saw that he was good. In the face of great oppression and danger, even in that moment, she could see he was special, and she hid him for three months. Now, she wasn't hiding him like when we hide things that we're ashamed of. She was hiding him as someone that she treasured, because she did. I was talking with a friend of mine this week, one of my best friends who is a mom of two. She has a four-year-old son and a four-month-old daughter. And so when it says that she hid her baby for three months and when she could hide him no longer, I just wanted to know, what is it about that three-month time period? I'm not a mom, I'm not, I'm not really sure. And she said, well, to be honest, I think if my sole goal and purpose was to keep my baby hidden, as their mom, I could do it. If I wasn't doing anything else, I would have to attend to their every need right away, but there's something about the more you're learning them, you know when they eat, you know when they sleep, and God has equipped you with everything you need to provide for that child. And so for those first three months, if that's the only goal, it could be possible. Surely she had motivation if the king and all the land wanted her son dead to provide for her son and to keep him hidden. 
But my friend was telling me that there is something that happens around that three to four month mark that not only do babies start rolling, but they start babbling and chattering and screaming when mom leaves the room. They don't want to be left alone. And it also makes it harder for moms to leave their children because their children are beginning to know who they are. They're beginning to light up when they come into the room and recognize who you are and recognize when you're gone. Those first three months, my friend said, you just give and give and give because you love your baby, but they can't really do much in return. But around that three month mark, they start to respond and they start to contribute more to the relationship, which made me think, no matter how hard it would have been for Moses' mom to place her baby in a basket in the Nile River that wasn't just some little lazy river at Hurricane Harbor or a resort. Like, no, the Nile River was huge. It was filled with alligators and there were hippopotami, I guess you say. That sounds weird. Uh, hippopotamus, hungry, hungry hippos. Um, they're dangerous, actually. And snakes. I mean, it was super dangerous for her to place her baby there. But then to know she's placing her baby there at what would have been at that point the hardest time to do it. I do imagine that your love grows with each day. And she'll, she did. So it says she makes him a basket. And that word basket in Hebrew is actually the word for ark, which is only used in the story of Noah's ark in Genesis. Are you seeing the relationship between Moses' story and the story of the people of God, the story of us, of Israel, of God's kids, that he created us and called us good God sent floodwaters, and he took Moses' family and two of every animal to save his people, to sustain his people, and he's doing it again right here. So she puts him in this waterproof basket. I just can't imagine that moment. And she lets him go. I'm going to hit this a little more later, but just so it starts to uh, maybe percolate. My question for you tonight is, what do you need to let go of? so you can hold fast to Jesus? What do we need to let go of so we can hold fast to Jesus? You see, if she had held on to her son, at some point, he likely would have been murdered. She would not have been able to keep him hidden any longer. But because Yochebed had the courage to let go of her son and the wisdom. Do you notice she puts him in the Nile River? She obeys the Pharaoh's decree, but she does it in such a way that entrusts him into the power of God, all-powerful. God's decree is much greater than the Pharaoh's or anybody else's. No one and nothing can stand in his way. If she had held tight to her son and not let him go, trusting God, I believe God's sovereign, and I think he might have done, you know, something different, but that wasn't the plan. This was his plan. Moses was going to grow up to be the one who leads God's people out of slavery in Egypt, who receives the Ten Commandments, who encounters God face to face. Moses, there's this huge call on his life, and it is contingent upon Yochebed's ability to let go and place him in the Nile. There are ripple effects that come from her surrender and her obedience and her faith that she did not know at this time. And quite frankly, we don't even know if she lived long enough to see what her son did and what her kids did together as they walked along with the people of God through the wilderness. But there are ripple effects to her act of faith, surrender, and obedience. And friends, there are ripple effects to your own acts of faith, surrender, and obedience that we may never see the side of heaven. What might God want to do with the things that we just can't seem to let go of so we can hold fast to Jesus. Verse 4 says the baby's sister, that's Miriam, then stood at a distance watching to see what would happen to him. So we don't know how old she is, but obviously she's old enough to walk along the riverbank. She's going to address the princess now in a little bit. So she's a good age, right? She's, I don't imagine she's a toddler, <laughs> But I love that it says she stood at a distance watching to see what would happen to him. She's watching. She's looking for it. She's wondering what's going to happen. You see, to have parents in the priestly line, Amram and Yochebed, I believe, were founded in the faith of God. I think that 
because there's things between the lines that we're not seeing here. I think that not only does Yochebed have a lot in common with Mary, but I think she has a lot in common with who we talked about in October, Hannah. Hannah prayed, right? Mary was familiar with Hannah's prayers because the Magnificat is very similar to Hannah's prayer. Do you remember well, I think Yochebed was a praying woman too because if you're about to lay your baby in a basket in the Nile River, yeah, I, all I can imagine is that prayer is the thing that sustains you to do that. And so I think that she taught her kids that. I think that her daughter, Miriam, I'd like to imagine that she's walking along the riverbank watching to see what's gonna happen to her baby brother and praying Now, I know that's speculation, but come on. The people of God, to see something like this happen, I believe she was praying and watching to see God work, as he will. Because soon, verse 5, Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river, and her attendants walked along the riverbank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. So do you notice This is something she did routinely, but she's aware. She's attentive. I want you to take note. As I keep pointing out, look at what we're looking for. Look at what we're seeing, right? It matters. Eyes open. So she sees this basket. Bring it to me. Verse 6, when the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying, understandably so. And she felt sorry for him. This is the daughter of the king who decreed that every Hebrew baby boy be thrown into the Nile to drown. And at first glance of this baby boy, she doesn't see him as an enemy to fear and to hate and to kill, but she feels compassion for him. And this is God being gracious. But what's more, I love this. She says, this must be one of the Hebrew children, she said in verse seven, Then the baby's sister Miriam approached the princess. Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you, she asked. You know, see, she was ready. She was watching to see what God was going to do. I believe she was praying, and she was ready to jump in. So don't only watch for what God is doing and is going to do, but be ready to jump in and participate in what God is doing and is going to do. Because before the princess had time to process and ponder her possible response, Responses to this Hebrew baby boy in a basket before her. His sister steps in. I'd like to think that that is God using her to step in, don't you think? His sister steps in and says, should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? His sister gives her this reason to believe that this is a baby you need to care for, not to kill. But she knows that that princess is not going to care for her herself. She's not equipped to be able to feed this baby? Should I go find one of the Hebrew women to nurse this baby boy for you? Wise, not just brave, but wise. Wisdom that I think only comes from God. So then the princess responds, yes, do. Yes, do. Praise God. That takes courage too, don't you know? She's going against the decree of her own dad. Hmm. And you also see these are two different classes of women because now at this point, the dad has made it so that Egyptians and Israelites are enemies. And yet we see God binding them together. Can I say weaving them together for a shared purpose of life? She says, yes, do. So the girl went and called the baby's mother, Batsio Kebed. The princess says, take this baby and nurse him for me. She told Yochebed, I will pay you for your help. So the woman took her baby home and nursed him. Isn't that crazy? She had to have the courage to place her baby in the basket, not knowing that she was about to receive him back for a time to be able to care for him and provide for him. And what's more, get paid to do it? (laughs) Isn't that bizarre? But it just reminds me of a few things. Do you know before this, we have the story of Abraham and Isaac. God leads Abraham to be willing to lay his son Isaac down, to sacrifice him. Horrific. But his trust in God leads him to that point, and then God intervenes, and he provides another sacrifice, and he receives his son back. Now we get to Yochebed, 
And I believe at God's guidance, she's led to let go of her son, to entrust him into the hands of God, not knowing what would happen to him. And in that act of faith, God intervenes, and she receives her son back. And doesn't it sound so much like our God who so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish. We don't need to fear death, but we can live with him forever. That he lets him go for a time, for three days, but we get him back as he rose from the dead and he's coming back for us. Again, do you hear the same story? Would we have courage to let go so we can hold fast to Jesus? Verse 10 says, later when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses for she explained, I lifted him out of the water. Now, we don't know how old Moses was at this point. Everything I've read is entirely speculation, but it is true that people lived a lot longer in these days, and it seems that they also nursed a lot longer. So it could have been anywhere from two to three to four or more years. Whatever it may be, we do know that it was enough time for Yochebed and perhaps Amram and the whole family to be able to entrust foundational truths to Moses from such a young age about who God is and therefore who he is. Knowing that he's going to be raised in the home of Pharaoh, of Egyptians who don't know the God of Israel. They have an urgency to entrust what is true and foundational into his life from a young age. We know this because in chapter 3, when Moses is walking and he sees this bush that is flaming with fire, but it is not consumed, he's curious. And what does he do? He goes aside and he looks at it. Do you hear that? He actively looks to see what's happening. And it's from that space that God reveals himself directly to Moses. And he says, Moses, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses wants to cover his face. Why? Because he knows who it is. He doesn't say, wait, who? He knows. That foundational knowledge of who God is and therefore who he is. He knows. So then later when God reveals his personal name to Moses, when Moses asks who will I say sent me? And God says, tell him that I am sent you, for I am who I am, and I will be who I will be. And Moses says, who am I to go? And God says, I will be with you. Don't you know? Moses knew. She names him Moses. That's an Egyptian name that was very common in that time. But it would have sounded like Moshe, which sounds like the Hebrew word Masha, which means to draw out. And that's only used when David speaks of God as rescue. When he says, you stepped down from heaven and you drew me out of deep waters. You see it in 2 Samuel and you see it again in the Psalms. You drew me out of deep waters. This rescue of God. Little did she know that Moses' name would, would remind people of God's rescue. I love that. Because God does use him to rescue, doesn't he? And it had to be Moses. He had to grow up in that way to be able to stand up against the Pharaoh and lead the people of God out of slavery in Egypt. He had no idea at this point. He didn't even have a say. Do you see? God had a future plan for him. He didn't even have a say at this point. What we're reading in chapter 2 his mom had to have courage. His mom had to let go and trust God and surrender. And the ripple effects, let, ripple effects of that surrender led to the freedom of God's people and the reason we're still talking about him today. It's no small thing to me that Jesus is called the new Moses. What could Yochebed have even imagined the future that God had planned? not just for her son, for God's people. It mattered. 
What do you need to let go of so you can hold fast to Jesus? If I'm being honest with you as I process that question, this last year has been hard. Like I said, I'm so glad to be before you today because this time last year, I wasn't. When I got COVID, Delta, if some of y'all know my story, it was really, really hard. I almost went to the ER twice. To be frank, it almost killed me and that's not a dramatic statement. It was terrifying and sad and hard and painful and it has taken so much of my health from me in the last year. I've had COVID and the flu twice in the last year and I've also had just a lot of really big painful struggles and have felt so much sadness and discouragement. And I have been carrying this for the last year, but if I'm being honest, all of us have had a hard last couple of years. Ever since the pandemic hit, it just seems like there's this fog. The more I talk with my friends, we're like, it's just weird, I don't know what's going on. But I've realized that I have begun to take hold of my sadness. I've begun to take hold of my sickness and frustrations in that. And all those things are true. But what I'm challenging you to do, to let go of something so you can hold fast to Jesus, is that those things are still true, but there is a greater truth. Is there not? Jesus, in him there is always hope. No matter what, he is always doing something good and beautiful. Even if we can't see it, a lot of times we can't, but we need to actually look to see it. We need to ask God to show us, what are you going to do? I learned this just this week. I finished dinner with a friend who we were just commiserating over the hard time, and I was challenged to really look for what God might be doing instead of just taking ownership of the sadness. Maybe there is still joy. Maybe there is still beauty right here. I went to get a gift for a friend of mine who's getting married this weekend, and I knew precisely the items I was looking for, and I went to the store, and I couldn't find any of them in my go-to places. And I was discouraged, thinking, God, there's nothing here. What I'm looking for isn't here. And I kid you not, literally turned the corner, went down a new aisle, and in the wrong location was exactly what I was looking for, and in fact, better than what I had imagined. And a little further down was something else that was better than I had imagined, but went together. It was a one-stop shop. God provided not only what I was looking for, but what was better in what seemed like the wrong place and the wrong aisle that I wasn't gonna look. And I couldn't help but get his, uh, to recognize him speaking to me and teaching me in the middle of this aisle late at night, shopping. And it sounds silly, but I thought two things. One, God is doing something beautiful Beautiful when I can't see or recognize it, but I've got to look for it. Don't give up yet. But two, isn't it funny that over the last year, one of the moments that most encouraged me, that gave me the greatest joy and peace and faith came in the aisle of a shopping store? I mean, what? Like, who but God can do that? I was like, you're teaching me and you're teaching me through what's happening. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm probably talking in circles. But it was astounding to me two nights ago to see, God, no, this is what you want to do in my life. I'm taking ownership of all the sadness and all the darkness in these deep waters. But you want to come from heaven and pull me out of these deep waters. But I've got to let go of something so I can hold fast to you. Because we can't hold on to anything but Jesus and something else at the same time time. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. If we want to carry our cross, we can't hold on to anything else. I knew Emily when she was a teenager, and she wasn't in a group, but I have led different youth camps and groups and small groups, and an example I've done sometimes, I won't do it with you, is the guys and girls in the group, I'll say, who's the strongest person in the group? And it's usually this, you know, buff high school football player guy. And I'll say, come here. And he grabs a hold of my wrist, you know, like a tight grip like this. And then I have everybody else in the group come and just grab a hold of my arm. Not tight, just, just grab a hold of me. And they just stay still. And I say, okay, you go walking. And you try to drag me with you. And I'm going to try to go with you. And he's pulling with all of his might. And I'm trying to walk. And these people, these weak ones, <laughs> are just grabbing hold of me, not moving. And I cannot move. Can you imagine it? I, he's pulling with all of his might. And I cannot follow him while these things have a hold on me. Now, it's nothing about him. But I'm here to say, yeah, we can be 
long to Jesus, while we hold on to things that have a hold on us, but we're not going to be walking with Jesus and moving forward with Jesus into the life that he has for us while we're holding on to these lesser things that have a hold on us. Do you hear it? Do you see it? We've got to let go so we can hold fast and keep walking. God is doing something beautiful in our everyday There is something good, even in the darkness and deep waters. And sometimes that only good thing is him. God's going to go on to tell Moses what I told you earlier. I am, and I will be with you. As he calls Moses to go and do something terrifying for God's glory. Do you know that in Matthew chapter 28... Jesus is about to ascend to heaven and he tells his best friends, his closest followers. And it's a message for us today. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Do you hear it? It's the same message. It's the same call. And it's the same God. When I was in seminary, I learned that commentators and scholars agree that when you see God revealed in the Old Testament, be it in the burning bush or the pillars of flame and of clouds, you see that it's the Son of God who is revealing God's self to these people. The Son of God who later we get to know is Jesus when he's born to Mary and Joseph. So that means that the son of God who was in the burning bush who looks at Moses and says, I am, I will be with you. It's the same son of God, the same God who looks at his followers and says, be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. When God created us, he saw us as good. And he goes out of his way to save us and sustain us and send us forth into his glorious plans and purposes for his namesake and for our good. He has done it before. We've seen this story. He did it with Noah. He's doing it now with Moses. He did it with his son, who even death could not keep him down. And he is doing it with us. I don't know what is trying to take you out tonight. Friends, even being here, you know there were just a few of us in the room when we got here. Man, I say, get behind me, Satan. As you're telling me the cocoa is burned, I don't care. Get behind me, Satan. We have an enemy who wants to take us out. I've told you that before. But if death couldn't keep Jesus down, then if you are in Christ Jesus, not only is there therefore now no condemnation for you, but the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, so devil can't keep you down either. But are you going to hold on to what's holding on to you, or are you going to let go and hold fast to Jesus? Hold fast to Jesus. Keep walking with Jesus. Be free in Jesus. He's so much better. Not disregarding what's true. It's so true. I get it. I feel it. I'm with you. And I'm sorry. But there is a much greater truth that we can choose to hold fast to. That we can choose to own. To talk about. To share about. To identify with. To define our days. His name is Jesus. If we know the truth... He'll set us free. I believe that with my whole heart. What do you need to let go of so you can hold fast to Jesus? I'm so grateful for Yokevit's example of surrender and faith and obedience. We've got about 10 minutes for you to talk around your tables. The same question we always talk through. How do you see your story in Yokevit's story? Okay, well, sorry to close this up for a second. I want to wrap up with Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. You may know it. Paul writes, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable 
and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. We know that only one meets all of those descriptions at once, and his name is Jesus. So the reason I have said that with you is because when I say, what do we need to let go of so we can hold fast to Jesus? Holding fast looks like fixing our thoughts on what is true and honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable, things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Lord Jesus sure is. All these things are true. A lot of things we need to let go of are not necessarily bad, but there is a greater truth that we exist to hold on to, that we have been freed to walk with all the days of our lives as he's given us a new life. And so I pray that you've been encouraged tonight as you head into, I, back into this crazy, busy season, I know. But I pray that you leave tonight so much more in love with Jesus than when you arrived. I pray you leave tonight free of whatever you've been choosing to hold on to and fix your thoughts on and talk about over and over again. That's not him. He's better. So much better. And this time, I mean, every day is all about him, but this time of year is literally all about him. And yet it's so easy to miss him. My prayer is that none of us do. That we would hear his story like we're hearing it for the very first time. Praise God that he came to us as we are so that we could live with him forever. There's nobody else like him. I'll tell you something quick. Um, If you're with our church, we've been looking at the story behind Jesus' birth and the people in that story. And really looking into Mary and Joseph, and this week we'll do the shepherds, and the next week will be the wise men. And I was struck by the shepherds this year. That they hear, the, the first to hear the good news that Jesus has been born by a whole host of angels from heaven. Let's say, we bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And so they go to meet him. First, they're met by the good news of Jesus in their field of work, just as they are. And they go to meet Jesus where? In a home for animals. You know, these shepherds lived outside with animals. They had to reek. And when people expected this coming Messiah, they thought that he would come in a worldly sense of rule and royalty. And so it would have made sense for the shepherds to be invited into this pristine palace. But they meet Jesus in a home for animals. As people who lived outside with animals. Do you see, if they'd stepped into that palace, they would have looked down and felt lesser than. They would have felt small. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God came and he introduced himself to the shepherds in a place where the only thing that could captivate them was Jesus himself. They didn't think twice about their surroundings. They just met Jesus, behold him, and were filled with great joy, so much so that they went and told everybody about him. When the wise men show up later, where's Jesus? He's now in a home for humans. That makes sense. God meets us where we are and as we are. It's who he is. He's so kind. Whatever you're holding on to, whether it's good or bad, there's therefore now no condemnation for you who are in Christ Jesus. But would you hold on to the God who in his kindness came to us? Came to us. And he wants us to know him as we are. I've said it before, the voice of God is always one that draws us near, not one that casts us aside. And my prayer is that you hear him this Christmas. Emmanuel, God with us, come and behold him. Come. He's so worthy of our worship. You have cards on your table. We've kind of gone over time, so I'm gonna trust that you're going to take these home. 
we have many extra, so actually I'm thinking this is a God thing. If you wanna take more than one, you are free to. What I was hoping we would do together is for you to write out prayers for some friends, that you can give them these prayers this Christmas. That card has nothing about our church on it. It's just a gift for you to give to somebody else. The gift of prayer, it's a tremendous gift. And if that's not your comfort zone, there's some words in there that I think are really encouraging. So they kind of do the work for us. But find at least one friend this Christmas, but I challenge you to do more. We have lots of cards here. And give them the gift of your prayers. And if you've got the courage, tell them the story. Some of what I just shared with you, that God so loved the world, he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him will never need to fear death. We won't perish, but we'll live with him forever. Do you know that God loves you? It's an opportunity. You can give this to someone who knows Jesus or someone who doesn't. But take time to pray for that person. Write it out and then give it to him. It's a great gift. Who knows if God might use your card that you give to somebody to lead them to repentance by his kindness, to lead them to salvation in him, or to lead him to freedom like I pray some of us has found this semester and even tonight. As we let go of that which has been holding on to us and we hold fast to Jesus and walk with him. I hope you'll do it. Please do. Can I pray for us? Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to us where we are and as we are so that we can be with you where you are and become like you. What? That you who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. God, I don't understand that. And I don't necessarily feel that. But I choose to believe it because you said so. I think about my friend that challenged me this week. How do we know that Jesus is the only way? I have friends who have different spiritual practices and feel great peace. God, I'm reminded that I don't follow you to feel great peace. I follow you because you're worthy of it. And I believe what you said when you said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. I believe your word when it says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved, and that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I believe when I hear my brothers and sisters around the world who have grown up Muslim in places where they have never heard your name, Lord Jesus, and they are dreaming and they meet this man and wife, and you show yourself to them as Isa. You show yourself to them as Savior. And then you send your people, your workers, and they testify of this story, this story that we pass on from generation to generation because it is the power of salvation for all who believe. And these people say, we've been waiting for you, Lord Jesus. That's who I believe in. I worship you not because you make me feel good, not because of what it seems like you take hold of in my life or what you give to me in my life. But Lord Jesus, I worship you because you're so worthy of it. I worship you because you have always been and always will be. I worship you because you are filled with great love, that this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to die for us. Lord Jesus, would you show us what love is in a time and a place where we have made an idol of what we think is love and it is so much less. God, we confess that we have fallen into the traps of holding on to so much less than you. And you're kind because there are so many blessings that do come from knowing you and worshiping you. But at the end of the day, God, you are worthy. And we exist to worship you. And as a wise child of yours once said, we are restless until we find our rest in you. And so, Lord Jesus, would we find rest in you? You who said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God, we're coming. Lord Jesus, we're coming. Give us rest. Carry us. Sustain us. 
satisfy us and send us forth as your daughters to make known the glories of God until one day you call us home and we see you face to face. And oh, what a glorious day that will be. But until then, remind us who you are. Remind us who we are in you. Remind us of the greater truth. Would we hold fast to you? Amen. Well, I hope you have a Merry Christmas. February 1st, 2023, mark your calendars. We'll kick off a new semester of Woven right in this room at 6.30. And we'll kick off a new semester of Thread Groups the week after that. Look for an email from me with opportunities to register for a Thread Group if you're not a part of one yet. And if you are, I hope you'll continue in the spring. But be encouraged, you are loved. God has called you and created you according to his great purposes that we don't necessarily know yet. But I promise you that he is doing something beautiful in you and through you for his glory and for the good of his people. Go in peace.